Bom dia. I would like to thank the organizers, Shamik, Tomas, Roman, for inviting me to talk here. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I was here five years ago or something, where there was no institute still, and we were in a very nice villa with a swimming pool six years ago, apparently. And so we had a lot of fun last time, and we are having fun now. So as you see, my, the title of my talk is outrageously general. But obviously, I'm not going to talk of all the possible quantum magnets. I will talk only some restricted species, and I will define it in the following. Luckily, I don't need to justify too much my investigation to this audience, because you all know that long range, or you all believe that long range interactions are important. This investigation takes the move from the experimental realization of long range interactions in trapped ions. So this is the nice figures of trapped ions in a pending trap. From the study of uh, cold atoms into cavity system, where the scattering of the light with the atom creates a long-range interaction, which is actually fully connected. And also, I have a lot of interest uh, in systems that have, uh, so we have seen today some figures which are very close to this, uh, so this coarsening. But these are believed to be equilibrium state of two-dimensional films uh, of copper where do you have dipolar interaction which are antiferromagnetic and so they create this strange pattern. So this, is, this should be equilibrium. <laughs> or, uh, this is the experimentalist thinks that this is equilibrium. Okay, so before going into the deep of my talk, that will be about long range interaction which are power low decaying, which one over R to the alpha. I need to acknowledge my funding. So I am in Heidelberg and I'm part of this ESOC one center. So we are working mainly on cold atoms physics, and we have also results for dynamics of short-range system. Please look at our archive with, together with experimentalists. Uh, I'm not listing the two authors just because I want to include myself, but we are both first author of this paper, and uh, we are very proud of these results, and they will be out on Friday on some fancy journal that you can see. This work has been also realized in collaboration with the University of Saarbrücken, uh, which is founded by this funding agencies, NACWAS, which I don't even know. And finally, in Heidelberg, we have, I also am part of this collaboration that structures, that's an excellence cluster, which has been, uh, which has, was born uh, just this year, this year, and uh, it's a very, very huge cluster which is trying to unify, to build some unified approach to phenomena in mathematics, physics, and complex data. So you see the name structures, you mean stru clustering structures, stuff like that. And I'm also part of this, and uh, if anybody of you is interested to see this growing and flourishing community, you can write me and I can invite you to Heidelberg and uh, whatever. Okay, so let's go to physics. So I already told you a bit about the motivations. Here I need to acknowledge the paper where, I s where I've stolen the figure. <laughs> so this, the figures were stolen by these papers. Then uh, I'm gonna talk very briefly about the formalism I'm going to use, and then I'm going to deal with uh, equilibrium physics, uh, which I treat mainly the weak long-range regime, because is the w I'm interested in universal properties, and the universal properties are going to be non-trivial in the weak long-range case, so when alpha is larger than the dimension of my system. And then I'm going to talk about dynamics, but dynamics is more interesting in the case of strong long-range interactions, so where alpha is smaller than this. And I'm really going to talk about only alpha equal to zero. Okay. So I already told you the motivations. More well, motivations is mainly reali uh, realization with uh, all the ions uh, of long-range interactions. I don't want to spend too much time about this. Uh, I like also the realization that is done in this uh, two-dimensional film of copper. So these two-dimensional magnets, uh, they have long-range interactions, uh, and they build uh, these beautiful stripe patterns. Uh, and I will tell you why I'm interested in this kind of systems, because this system are realization of long-range Eisenberg antiferromagnets. Okay, so the method I'm gonna use is functional randomization group. Functional randomization group uh, is exactly as the same qualitative picture of randomization group. So you, have, you want to compute some partition function, which is the integral over some um, internal degrees of freedom of one action, which for me that I normally like to work uh, in the Euclidean formalism is just the Hamiltonian. And uh, I want to integrate them, I want to do this integral step by step. So I want to integrate the modes 
one after the other and transform this integral into a differential equation. And so the, the picture is exactly the one of uh, standard normalization group. So you start with a theory that you can solve, some mean field theory, and you try to build a differential equation that's uh, gonna guide you towards a trajectory in theory space with some fake time, which is the renormalization group time, is gonna guide you to the exact theory of your model. And obviously this has never been possible and what functional RG does is try to build the best possible trajectory, which is not often optimal, to reach a point which is close enough to the exact point, okay? The system I'm gonna deal with, with this technique, is the quantumizing chain. So, an easing model, we have heard a lot of talks about it, I don't think I need to define. The spins are quantum, so they are Pauli matrices. We, it's in a transverse field, and so, it has two phases, one symmetric phase where there's exponential correlation where the uh, interaction is very weak with respect to the external magnetic, with the longitudinal magnetic field. And we have another phase when the interaction are very strong in which you have uh, basically a finite order parameter. So this is the same model that Tomas was treating in the first talk. And what I'm trying to do, I'm gonna go beyond the estimation that uh, he already told us with mean field, not the dynamics that he did with mean field, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to dress a little bit the description of the equilibrium universal properties. So the universal properties as defined as the, the scaling of certain quantities uh, close to the critical point. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna define a control parameter, H minus HC, and I'm gonna find the scaling of two different quantities, and this is enough for me to describe all the other universal, all the other scalings, because I can build the other scaling from that. And these quantities are the correlation length of my system, which scales, uh, which diverges at the critical point with a certain exponent that I call nu, and the gap, so the difference between the energy of the ground state and the first dynamically accessible excited state, which closes like uh, lambda to some z nu power. Okay, so this is just a representation of how these two quantities behave. So the gap closes at the critical point and the correlation line diverges. And I'm not gonna treat only the Ising model, but also a generalization of the Ising model, which are called quantum rotors model. So they are models which have uh, ON symmetric, that are ON symmetric, you can imagine this if it, like it is the position of a particle which is living on a sphere, okay? So for each side of my one-dimensional lattice, I have a particle which lives on a sphere centered on that side, and the particles want to align themselves. So there's an interaction that wants all these particles to be at the same angle with respect to the z-axis, for example. And so why I am interested in this model? I'm interested in this model because the universal behavior of this model is exactly the same I, I am not gonna demonstrate, but I can tell you reference about that, of the Eisenberg antiferromagnets. So this is not the same, so this is ON symmetry, so it's not the same as ferromagnetic spins uh, that will be SUN in the quantum world, so there, there is confusion about this, but ON and SUN are not the same, at least there is just O2 that is equal to SU1, all the rest is gone, but when you put antiferromagnetic interaction on quantum spins, you can map them into the rotors. So you can map into the ON uh, quantum model. They have a critical point exactly analogous to the one that has also the easing, so I'm not gonna, it's the same, they just have different critical exponents. Okay. So I'm gonna treat them when they have long range interaction, so this, JIJ coupling that is occurs here between these rotors, uh, the case as a power law, and I'm gonna use the same parameterization of the talk before, that we had D plus sigma, in which D is the dimension of the model, and once again, in my case, D is gonna be one. And sigma is a positive parameter. And then you see that I'm able to derive uh, this nice phase diagram of the model in the sigma D plane, so when sigma, is larger than two, I am sure that the behavior of the model is gonna be, the, the universal behavior is gonna be in the same universality class of the short range model. So the this quantity, the critical exponents 
are not able to distinguish between a nearest neighbor and a long-range interacting system if sigma is larger than two. Vice versa, if sigma is smaller than two, it's a little bit controversial, and I will discuss this point. But for sigma small enough, and small enough it means that it's lower than two enough, we will enter in a regime where the critical exponents are really some quantities that are different from the nearest neighbor case, but they cannot be computed with any easy approximation. So you need to really solve. You cannot compute it exactly. You have to do order numerics, or you have to do renormalization group approaches, which are going to be approximate. Differently, when sigma is small enough, and for small enough is, is less than the mm, 3 half d, I guess, this is going to be in the mean field regime. And uh, uh, in the mean field regime, these critical exponents are going to be valid for all DON throttle models. So these are the critical exponents in the mean field regime. So sigma is equal to uh, z, z is equal to sigma half, and nu is equal to 1 over sigma. And so I have given all the information to compute these two. And uh, eta, I will tell you about later. And so this is this question was valid for, for, for the case in which we are in the easing case. So here I wrote n equal 1, because for some crazy reason, I like to think of n as a continuous variable. But if you don't like this, please just say n, n less than 2 is n equal 1, and n equal 1 is the Ising model, which I introduced in the beginning. And so this was the picture for the Ising model and for the, basically, for the case of rotors, so where n is larger or equal than 2, it behaves very similarly. The only difference is that you have also the mermin wagner theorem, and the mermin wagner theorem tells you that if you are in this gray region, no phase transition can happen. So in addition to the Ising case, the ON model also have this gray region. And you see I was smart enough that in the Ising, I didn't want to go to d less than 1 because I don't know what happens there. I have no theorem that tells me, and it's a mess, and so I didn't report it in the plot. OK, so uh, the important part that I also to mention is that when you are close, closer to 2, and I will show you, or at least I will argue this, there is uh, the boundary, which is sigma equal 2 that I was discussing before, is going to be shifted uh, by the inclusion of interaction effect by the normalization group. And this interaction effect will shift the boundary by a quantity that I call eta short range which is nothing but the renormalization of the field dimension in the start or nearest neighbor Ising model. So once I, this, once I have found these boundaries with my renormalization group approach, what I can, what I can do is I can plot the critical exponent be in the bound, so in this region, where I know that they are non-trivial, let's say. And so you see, for n equal 1, I have this, uh, for n equal 1, I have this red line. And you may not see them, but there is also there are some red points, uh, which are here. So the red points are Monte Carlo simulations. And you see that my approach is very good in reproducing the expected z from Monte Carlo simulation. And then here it flattens, because at this point is the sigma star. So it's not, it doesn't flatten exactly at 2, but it flattens. Uh, it flattens a little bit before, and this before is given by the 0 0.25, which is the anomalous dimension of the nearest neighbor case, as you may know. Okay? So for the n equal 1 case, the I think I have a very good agreement. While for the case of the xy model, so n equal to 2, which is the quantum retard model with two components, I have a good agreement in the region where sigma is close to the mean field, which is not surprising. And then I have some discrepancy. You see the Monte Carlo simulation, the blue dots, seem to mimic what it happens to the easing. But apparently, for given so the result given from my calculation is different, because in this model, there is no symmetry breaking in d equal 1 due to the mermin wagner theorem. So this is the quantum O2 model in d equal 1. It is equivalent to the quantum to the classical O2 model in d equal 2. It does no finite temporal phase transition in d equal 2. And in quantum, it has no phase <laughs> quantum phase transition in d equal 1. And so I do not expect any shift, because somehow the anomalous dimension of the short range nearest neighbor case vanishes 
And so I expect the shift to be exactly at two, and my method reproduces this. This is the blue curve. But the Monte Carlo simulation, for some reason, they see a shift which we cannot justify. OK, so this is the case of the z exponent in one, one dimension. In two dimension, it's very similar, but a little bit more trivial. I, so this dashed line is the mean field result. And so as you see, in d equal 1, uh, the shift from the mean field is pretty big, while in d equal 2, the shift from the mean field is pretty small. And so you don't need, we don't need to discuss a lot about this. Now I'm going to compute uh, z nu, and I'm going to report 1 over z nu. That is the other exponents that I promised you. And this exponent, as you see, also I have the Ising case, which gives this nice red line, which agrees pretty good with Monte Carlo simulation that are the red points. These triangles are also Monte Carlo simulation, but uh, they are not trustable because they see an exponent which is different from the mean field result also when they when everybody, so every technique is sure that the system should be in the mean field behavior, so should have mean field behavior. So the triangles are not trustable, the dots are much better, and we are in agreement with the dots. And once again, for the I think everything seems pretty fine. There is a little bit of discrepancy, but the discrepancy, as you see, is larger in the nearest, ne so in the regime where the interaction, where long range interactions are irrelevant, where the system looks like nearest neighbor, and this is pretty obvious because if you have long range interaction, interaction is going to be stronger and the system is going to be closer to the mean field. So obviously when long range interactions are stronger, the normalization group works better. And when long range interactions are weak and they enter in the nearest neighbor regime, this is the most correlated regime, which is more difficult to tackle for the normalization group techniques. And so there is this little bit of a displacement. Uh, and once again, if I look at the case of continuous symmetry, so the O2 model, the quantum O2 model in one dimension, so this is still D equal one. I have a good agreement close to the mean field boundary for the O2 model, and then I have these divergences. But here, I am sure to be right. Because here, I have an expansion around this point, which has been obtained by the so-called 2 plus epsilon expansion by Zinjastan. And I know exactly that this quantity has to, has to go to 0 with this dashed line that you see here. And so you see that my quantity nicely interpolates between the mean field result and this other exact behavior, while the Monte Carlo simulation fails miserably to predict this. And so I also believe that I am right here, while the Monte Carlo simulation are wrong. OK? So this is three dimension. This is also very close to the mean field result, so I'm not going to comment on it. Well, now. I can basically go to do some dynamics, which nowadays everybody finds most interesting, even if I like the equilibrium normally. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to try to drive the system with uh, a very slow, so I'm going to cross the critical point with a slow, slow drive. So I initiate my system with a very large lambda in the paramagnetic phase, let's say. And then I'm going to. Uh, then I'm going to decrease lambda very, very slowly. And the slowness is given by the velocity of my drive, which is this delta. And when delta is equal to 0, I expect that we have universal behavior also in the dynamics. Because if delta is very, so if I cross the critical point very slowly, I expect all the dynamics to be controlled by the universal behavior of the equilibrium critical point. This is well known. And it has been studied a lot in the icing model with near stable interaction. I assume somehow that these studies can be generalized easily to the case of weak long-range interactions. So I find this less interesting. And so I'm going to focus on the case in which the interaction are strong long-range. So in which the interaction are in the regime in which you cannot do the integral of Jij with respect to J. And I, as an ex, uh, as an ex, as a um, an exemplificatory case, I'm going to study the case in which the J and J are completely flat, so the system is fully connected. So normally, for a system like this, uh, which has interaction which are not so strong in long range, you will expect uh, the system. So for sure, 
it's true that the system has a adiabatic behavior if this inequality is satisfied, where delta is the dynamical gap of the system. So when my drive induce, so if I drive the system, I have a time-dependent Hamiltonian. I can always imagine to study the spectrum of that Hamiltonian point by point adiabatically. So for each time, I diagonalize that Hamiltonian as if the drive were not active. And so I will have a gap, which is the difference between the energy of the ground state and of the first ex sta excited state. I have a gap which depends on time, and this is the adiabatic gap. I call it adiabatic because I am assuming uh, that the system can follow the drive adiabatically, so there is no effect uh, due to the drive. Uh, the driven system behaves like a series of shots uh, of equilibrium systems. And I know that this adiabatic condition, I know that this description in which I diagonalize the Hamiltonian point by point like, it if, like if it were in equilibrium is going to work if the time derivative of this adiabatic gap is much smaller than the adiabatic gap to the square. And you can imagine this because obviously if, if this parameter, which is the one that controls the dynamics, varies very slowly with respect to itself, it means that your system basically, that the states of your system cannot be mixed. If you start in the ground state, you drive your system slowly, the ground state has a very large gap with the first excited state. If you are slow enough, and for slow enough I mean this, you can never, exci you can never generate excitations to the first excited state. So this is the quantum description of this low driving, but normally this is compatible with a description in terms of creation of domains in the Ising model. Here I did it in two dimensions because it's nicer and it can be somehow always justified doing the classical quantum to classical correspondence. So what you can do is you can always describe this kind of slow drive uh, like if you are forming domains uh, of the wrong magnetization in a state which is fully magnetized, okay? So you start in the equilibrium state, you drive it slowly across the critical point, the system wants to magnetize, but is not able to reach exactly the equilibrium critical point that is fully magnetized and it will create some bubble of the wrong magnetization in a state which is overall fully magnetized. Okay, this can be justified also in other ways but I don't want to talk about it. So, this picture, so this is one description with respect to, let's say, only dynamical quantities of the quantum model this is a special description that is the one that was originally formulated by Kibble and Zurek in their paper. And normally when you apply both to a quantum system with short range interactions, uh, these two descriptions are gonna give you compatible results. Let's us try this. Uh, and what we do is just we try to compute what is called residual energy, which why sometimes I call heat, even if it's not really heat because the system is a closed system. And this is the energy of the system, which has been driven from the equilibrium uh, very far in the par paramagnetic state, uh, very deep into the broken phase. And if I, my drive was low enough, I can expect uh, to have only a small deviation from the energy of the equilibrium state at the final point of my dynamical protocol. And this small deviation that I call Q is going to scale with the velocity because we expect it to go to zero with the velocity because if I am infinitely slow, I expect to reach exactly that equilibrium point. But we know that, the, that the, it has to scale with an exponent theta, which is not an analytic exponent to do the fact that we have crossed a uh, quantum critical point. So the fact that we crossed an equilibrium, uh, an equilibrium critical point during the drive means that all the quantities have to scale with non analytic power. And this is the non analytic power. And it has to be related with the equilibrium critical point that I have discussed before. And as I told you, there are different ways to describe this phenomenology in a nearest neighbor system. All these ways are gonna give you different answers. But if you check for this answer in a model which everybody knows, that is the Ising model, all these answers are gonna turn out correct. Because in the Ising model with nearest stable interactions, Z nu is equal to one, and all these agree. Okay. 
and all this agrees with, with each other. And even if I do this argument uh, with long range interaction, which are weakly long range uh, for some model which I can solve exactly, these are gonna agree within themselves. However, when I go to the Lipkin mesh glick model, so the model which is fully connected, this is, they are not gonna agree. But before I want to tell you how I'm gonna treat this model, in this case I'm not gonna do renormalization group because a fully connected system is beyond <laughs> my capabilities with renormalization group. I'm gonna do something much more traditional, which is taking a old same premac of approximate, uh, old same premac of transformation and then cutting it uh, and then doing a bogle Bors transformation. So what I do, I try to map this system, which is a fully connected Ising model, is if, since it's fully connected, it behaves like a large giant spin. And I'm gonna map it uh, to harmonic oscillators. I'm not gonna tell you how I'm gonna do it, I'm just saying that I can do it. So I'm gonna tell you that uh, the quantum cor the quantum effect uh, are gonna be encoded. So the quantum effect are encoded in the shift between the result of the operator H minus the energy that I will have at mean field. The quantum correction are gonna behave like bosons and like a single bosonic mode, like the one of an harmonic oscillator. This model has a phase transition exactly like the short range using model. The critical point is that H equal one or H equal to J, but I said J equal one. And uh, I have the scaling both in the symmetric and the broken phase because this model is easy enough that I can solve it exactly. And I have these critical exponents, nu is equal to three half and Z nu is equal to one half. And when I plug this into the two into the three scaling that I've mentioned above, I find that the results disagree because one result gives three half and the other result gives one third. But this is not the only point. It's not just that the theory fails. You can also find numerical results in the literature which they agree both with one or with the other conjecture. And so it's very different, difficult to understand what's really going on in the system because the two standard argument of keyboard Zurek, the spatial and the energy one disagree, and also the numerics is sometimes is in agreement with one and sometimes is <laughs> in agreement with the other. So, and this is all, all of this is due to the fact that this z nu is equal to one half instead than one. Okay, so as I said, I'm gonna treat uh, the case of strong long range interactions, fully connected, and I mapped it to a quantum harmonic oscillator and the cool thing of the quantum harmonic oscillator is that I know everything. I can solve the model dynamically. So if I told you that this, is a, that this system reduced to a quantum harmonic oscillator and this delta, which is the gap between the, the, the ground state and the first excited state is depending on time, if this is an harmonic oscillator and it is at lowest order, I can solve it exactly. Because this gap, so this omega is exactly like delta so they are the same quantity. Now I call it omega to make uh, contact with the harmonic oscillator. And when I solve it dynamically, I know everything. I know the adiabatic states, obviously, because they are just the equilibrium basic of the harmonic oscillator in which I barely substitute the time-independent depend time frequency with the time-dependent one. So this is the definition of adiabatic states. I solve the system like it, like if it like if it were in equilibrium, but uh, with the quantities that are time dependent, and this is the result. But I also know the exact state in which I solve the system not for the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, but for the eigenstate of the Liouvillian, which is the time dependent operator. So I can do this, I can study them, I don't want to get into the details of this because I don't have time, and I can compute the fidelity. So. The fidelity is just telling me if I started in the ground state at the beginning, deep in the paramagnetic phase, and I go slowly across the transition far in the ferromagnetic state, what is the correction? So the fidelity is going to be one if I remained in the ground state forever, but I didn't. And the defect density, which is basically very close to one minus the fidelity. And this is what we are going to obtain that everything depends on this parameter lambda, which is 
n, the size of the system, multiplied by delta. And so here is v because this I stole from a numerical article. And we find that also our results, theoretical results, are perfectly in agreement with what was numerically found in this paper, and they had no way to justify this fact. So in this fully connected system, everything is going to depend not from the velocity, but by n, which is the size of the system, multiplied by the velocity. And this means that basically, when n is equal to infinity in the thermodynamic limit, there is not going to go any keyboard zero scaling, so there is no power law scaling, but the system is always in the quench regime. Because the effective velocity is not delta, but it's n multiplied by delta, and if n goes to infinity, the system is always, the velocity is always infinity, and the system is always in a quench regime. This is in agreement with some analytical results on an harmonic oscillator that by mathematician. I don't have time to discuss this. We were very happy about it. And so, keyboard Zurek appears only as a crossover, but the real result of the red line is that it becomes a quench. Well, okay, this I said, and these are my amazing collaborators. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one or two quick questions. So this is just a very simple question for the understanding. So your harmonic oscillator is basically your collective